welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of The Heal Podcast, I get to talk to the amazing Dr. Mark Hyman. Dr. Hyman is a practicing family physician and an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine. He is the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, senior advisor for the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, a 14-time New York Times best-selling author, and board president for clinical affairs for the Institute for Functional Medicine. He is also the host of one of the leading health podcasts, The Doctor's Pharmacy, and that's pharmacy with an F. Today, we get into his latest book, The Pegan Diet. For all of you out there that are confused about what to eat and what not to eat, I highly recommend reading this book as a launching point to understanding more. I thought I knew a lot, but this book gave me so much clarity. I am a huge proponent of working with a functional medicine doctor and receiving customized healthcare, and today, Mark Hyman will tell us why. And after reading The Pegan Diet, I am also now fired up with a new mission to help end factory farming. It's not only destroying our health and our planet, but it's terrorizing innocent animals. And lastly, after this conversation with Dr. Hyman, I am now confident that even people who feel they cannot afford organic food or healthy choices can actually completely overhaul their health and lives through buying whole foods on a very minimal budget. And Mark has the story to prove it. Let's dive in. Uh, Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's an honor to have you as a guest. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, so your book, the Pegan diet, I know everybody starts off, you know, asking about the Pegan diet and how the name <laughs> Pegan came to be, but I think it's a great story. And, uh, I'd love for you to tell how you came up with the name and it's kind of the fundamental principles of the Pegan diet. Sure. You know, I've been, I've been, uh, on the path of studying nutrition for over 40 years. Uh, I studied nutrition when I was at Cornell, even back before when I was a kid and we had a garden, we had fruit trees in the backyard. My mother made fresh food. They, they grew up in Europe during the fifties. So they kind of missed the, the fast food culture. <laughs> and, uh, and then I you know, sort of really got clear that we we're in this period of time after studying nutrition, practicing nutrition, using food as medicine, as a functional medicine doctor for over 30 years, the amount of conflict and divisiveness and confusion about what to eat. It's just so massive. You've got the paleos on one side, the ketos here, you know, the, uh, the breatharians, the vegetarians, the, you know, the, 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 the raw food is, I mean, you, you just go on and on and on and everybody thinks they're right. And everybody is, you know, on a, on a, a evangelical tear to make the other wrong. And, it's just the wrong approach because there are foundational nutritional principles that we actually all agree on and that our common sense combined with the best science we have to come up with a way of eating that is good for us and good for the planet. It's personalized and it uses food as medicine. That's really the foundation of the concept of the Pecan diet. And the name was kind of a spoof on the conflict between paleo and vegan. And I was sitting on a panel with a couple of friends of mine, both were doctors. One was an extreme like vegan hardcore cardiologist. The other was a paleo doc with a little bit aggressive and they were fighting, you know, like kind of cats and dogs. And I'm like, mm, 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 in the middle, literally in the middle of it, like, going like this. And I'm like, Hey guys, listen, if you're paleo and you're vegan, I must be pegan. And the whole room cracked up. And I thought, Oh, okay, well this, this works. You know, <laughs> this is a good joke. And, and then I began to think about it. I was like, mm, on the way home, I was like, gee, they're actually identical except for one thing. <laughs> they all, they both agree we should be eating whole food. They both agree we should be eating lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, that we should be eating nuts and seeds, that we should be having good fats, that we should be eating food that's good for us and good for the planet, that we should be even eating dairy, that you know, everything is sort of the same except for one thing, which is where to get your protein, which is greens or beans or animal food. That's it. <laughs> I was like, this is really ridiculous. So 
let's kind of like try to look through the science and come up with a set of, of principles that are guidelines. They're not dogmatic. So it's how do we get away from the dogma? And often what I see people is doing is they let their dogma, you know, uh, kind of screw them up. They let their ideology run over their biology and damage them. And so see people say, I'm, you know, going to be vegan. And then like, it's actually not good for them. So I'm going to eat like lots of, you know, cheese because I love cheese and it's good for me. And I'm like, that doesn't work for them. Or they're going to like, so everybody's kind of got to figure out what's right for them. And, 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 and th there really are two fundamental principles above all for the vegan diet. One is food is medicine. And that doesn't mean everybody needs the same medicine, right? Everybody doesn't need the same medicine, but it's medicine and quality should be the number one value that you place on the food you're eating. How is the quality of the food? I mean, I just got back from Europe and I ate a tomato there, I ate a tomato here, I had a carrot there, I had a carrot there. It's like, how do they do that? It's like, it's like, it doesn't even taste I like the know. same vegetable. And I'm like, I'm, I'm shopping at, you know, good stores. And if I go to the farmer's market, it's a little bit different. But if I just go to the, even the health food store, or the, you know, the, the healthy grocery store, I'm like, it doesn't taste the same. So the quality is determined all the way back to the seed and to the soil and to the farm and the farming techniques, so the whole trajectory. So quality is really key. And there's a lot of ways to sort of define quality. The second principle that's so important is personalization. There isn't one size fits all. And, and it changes over time. It changes based on your age. It changes based on, you know, um, the, the things that you're doing. If you're an athlete, you know, lifting weights and running and doing all kinds of stuff, you might need a different diet than if you're a 97 year old lady, you know, in a wheelchair. So like, there's this really important to understand that personalization is so key. And, and there are ways to do that. And one of the chapters in the book is on how do you, how do you leverage personalized nutrition for yourself? And it's, there's ways that we do that in functional medicine. And that's really what's foundational to functional medicine. So that's the long-winded answer. There are more principles, but those are really the foundational principles. Well, I love it because your book is so, just like you said, there's so many confusing diets and, and one kind of comes on the tail of another to be the opposite. And then everybody's confused and trapped in this dogmatic way of being and and, and just the very awareness of we are bio-individual, we have so many factors play into, you know, what's right for us. So to cultivate that awareness of, of how your body's speaking to you through symptoms and other things, and then work with someone like a functional medicine doctor to get that, the biomarkers and the feedback so that you can get really personalized, uh, Absolutely. you know, a diet for you. So, uh, but I do, I love how your book just, it, it is so... It, it almost just simplifies it because you still have to get specific, but you talk about- There it is. <laughs> there it is. That's right. There you are. <laughs> but it's, it, and you write in such a way that's so digestible for, you know, I love a good pun. No, but, um, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you said something very interesting early on, and, and we've heard this all before. Hippocrates said it, you know, perhaps first, but food is medicine but you said food is medicine with the power to heal and the power to harm, yeah. which I've always, we've known that we know that a lot of stuff in our food and these Franken foods are harmful, but I've never heard. We just make this assumption that medicine means good for you. No. And, no. and so now it's no. like, Oh yeah. I mean, like, food, food can do harm and heal and medicine can do harm. and Of heal. course. Of course. I mean, I mean, look at the study that came out on aspirin today was showing that, we thought, oh, well, everybody should take aspirin to prevent a heart attack. And gosh, no, maybe if you're over 60, even if you're high risk, it's more likely to kill you from taking the aspirin than it is from a heart attack because of the bleeding risks from your stomach and the stroke risk. Now, I've known that for a long time. I've said that. I've written about it. But sort of, there's been plenty of, of smoke. Uh, but now the fire is really clear from this last study. And I think, you know, on the other hand, aspirin might be great if you have a headache, you know, to take an aspirin, or if you, you know, have arthritis, it might help a little bit occasionally to take something. So it's really about understanding what is the right medicine for you in the right moment, with the right dose, in the right treatment for the right problem. And I, I think that's where we kind of lose track. And I think I use me, I use food uh, literally as a drug. And, and is a, if I'm treating someone with diabetes, I use it in one way. If I'm using it to treat someone with autoimmune disease, I use it another way. If it's someone with autism or Alzheimer's, it might be something different. And it's very much that specific. You know, it's, it's like, you know, we have, you know, you know, 50 antibiotics, whatever. So you're not just going to use any random antibiotic. Oh, you got infection, take an antibiotic. No, 
what is the antibiotic that works for that particular bug? And so that's really the, the specificity of food as medicine, something people don't understand. And what and when I when I actually talk about what food as medicine is, is it's it's not just sort of the abstract concept. We actually understand, I talk about in the book, and I literally, I wrote a, I wrote like 15,000 words I had to cut out of the book that really describe in detail how food influenced good or bad each aspect of our biology, we call the matrix in functional medicine, each of our functional systems. The body is made up of these seven functional systems, all networked together, all have to be working for you to be healthy. And if you're out of balance, you're sick. And if they're in balance, you're healthy. So there's your gut, your immune system, your, your detox system, your energy system, how you make energy, your hormones, your communication system, your structural system. All these systems have to be working in order for you to be healthy. And food can harm or heal. For example, let's take COVID and your immune system. If you are eating a American processed diet, you are at very high risk of getting in the hospital and dying from COVID because it screws up your immune system in a big way. In fact, 63% of all hospitalizations from COVID were because of poor diet. Like, like chew on that for one second. Mm -hmm. like, like the reason the whole country is shut down crazy, everybody's nuts is because 63 to keep people out of hospitals, right? So we don't flood the hospitals. 63% of all people who went to the hospital was because of crappy food, yep. because it harmed their immune system. On the other hand, there's in food, a whole host of phytochemicals that actually are antiviral and immune supportive. So for example, if you have onions and you have, for example, um, the, 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 the you know, oranges and lemons and peels, which, which has quercetin, it's a powerful immune modulator and immune booster and antiviral. If you have olives and olives all also are antiviral and I could go on and on. I've written about this as a blog I wrote called, uh, you know, functional medicine approach to COVID-19. You can just go to drhyman.com forward slash C19. I talk about each food and like which food you should be including. And, and, it, and then how does it, that's just to your immune system, right? There's all these anti-inflammatory foods that you could be eating like turmeric and rosemary and ginger and, and you could be eating also omega-3 fats and a whole host of foods that actually help your immune system. Right? You could be eating herring and protein mushrooms and vitamin D and, and I could just go on and on. So literally you could, and, and that's my, my publisher, you know, doesn't like it because like, I write too much. So like, the, but but the, idea, of information. the idea, the idea is that, is that it, if you start to get really granular about food, you begin to understand that when you go to the grocery store, it's not a grocery store, it's a pharmacy. And you're going to find things in there that have terrible side effects, like high fructose corn syrup and processed food. And you're going to find stuff in there that's like profoundly healing that can transform people with autoimmune diseases and diabetes and reverse Alzheimer's and autism. I mean, you, it's really quite amazing when you start to kind of look at what's in there. And so when I'm shopping, I'm going to the aisle. I think it's a pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, right? That's my podcast is the doctor's pharmacy. And I, and I, and I go, wow, you know, we have, um, we have the potential to teach people how to change their understanding of what they're eating because food isn't just calories. It's not just, it's just not energy, which is what we think. Oh, co I, I, you know, as long as I moderate, like I can have a Coke, you know, that's fine. As long as it's in my calorie count, right? Mm -hmm. Nonsense. Because if you eat, for example, you know, a, let's say uh, an artichoke uh, and have the same calories from a Coca-Cola, well, the artichoke is full of prebiotic fibers. It's full of phytochemicals that upregulate your detoxification pathways. Uh, and it has all these other benefits and vitamins and minerals that the, the same calories and soda don't. And that has, that's information. So when you get that food is information, it's not just calories, that it's instructions, that it's code. It's literally programming your biological software with every single bite. Then you have an opportunity to go, whoa, you know, like what is happens when I do this. And I can tell you that we, we just did, um, we just did it. We just did a workshop with 16 people in, in Spain. It's called growing a new body. Cause literally in a week you can grow a new body. It's amazing. And we had everybody fill out a questionnaire. We call like a MSQ medical symptom questionnaire and they get a score. You rate you know, zero to four headache, diarrhea, runny nose, you know, menstrual cramps, whatever, you know, joint pain, fatigue, depression, and you get a score, zero to four. And at the, at the beginning, we had them do it. And at the end of six days later, we had them do it. Now, six days is not a long time. In six days, 
there was a 70% reduction in all symptoms from all diseases in everybody across the board. Now, now some people had much bigger drops. Some people had very low scores. So there wasn't, you know, they were like, you know, low. So they, you can't get lower than zero or you can't, it's like you go down a couple, yeah. but if you're basically healthy, but if you, you know, I always say if, if you don't have a headache and aspirin doesn't do anything, right? So <laughs> like it's basically, it's basically the idea that you could take people who are suffering in a week, change your diet. And then on the other side, outcomes that you would literally have to publish in the front page of every major medical journal, every major media outlet. It should be headlined. I mean, this is just stunning to me that we ignore this. And, and, and in fact, in, during COVID, you know, nobody's really been talking about it. We're talking about vaccines and drugs. And you know, nobody's talking about the fact that if your vitamin D level is over 50, literally the data show that there is a zero risk of death. Yes. Yes. Like, vitamin there's D. Not, there's not a zero risk of death from vaccines. Like why doesn't, I mean, I, I sent someone I know in the government, I said, I sent them the study. I said, look, maybe we should have a vitamin D mandate. That would be good. Right? Free vitamin D for all Americans. Like, how about that? <laughs> Seriously. And, and we're, we're laughing about it, but it's like, it's criminal. I know people that are like mm -hmm, struggling mm -hmm. right now and mm -hmm. family members that have people dying. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. there's so much you can do. And they're, mm -hmm. why aren't they shouting mm -hmm. that from the rooftops? Mm -hmm. It's just natural. Yeah. It's I, I, I don't want to go down that path because, but again, we're trusting agencies like the FDA and when they're allowing certain chemicals in our food that is causing people to be at risk for COVID, the 63% that are obese and sick and chronic health issues. So mm, back mm. to this idea of going into just the mere shifting our perception. And, and this shifted after I read the book about going into the grocery store and looking at it as a pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. And, and knowing that you can choosing, you know, eating from the rainbow and eating close to nature versus, you know, pulling off. So I'm not going to call out brands, but like processed packaged food with a whole bunch of preservatives and chemicals that your body doesn't recognize, um, it'll, it'll shift like, okay, so maybe you want your little treat, but, but if you're going to fill up your cart with 90% good, whole natural right. foods that are close to nature, your body's going to recognize that. And the yeah. same with weight loss. It's not just calories, like your Coke no. and your artichoke. No people store fat because the body systems are not functioning. It's not just this caloric overload. It's actually toxicity. Uh, so you want to eat real plant foods. So your body can actually digest and get the nutrients and, and process the food. But anywho, um, so, so let's talk about um, meat for a second, because oh. <laughs> we could talk for hours about meat according to your book but um i am a, a meat eater but i struggle because i'm also like spiritual and i feel like sometimes i judge myself i'm not spiritual enough but i, I i'm a qualitarian so i eat grass-fed you know organic just what you know, humane sustainable raised beef and um if i and i and i'm a cheese lover this is devastating that i'm a cheese lover but i only eat really imported like carry gold Irish cheddar, mm -hmm. or I eat uh, goat cheese, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So yeah. talk to us about just the difference between how, why quality of meat is important and what well, quality matters, right? Quality matters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Or, okay. Let's just, let's just say dairy, for example. Okay. Because meat, dairy, but just, I'll get to meat in a minute, but I just, okay. you, your cheese story kind of reminded me of this, okay. of this story. So, um, you know, in America and increasingly around the world, we, we, we industrialized dairy production. And in order to do that, we've, we've created a breed of cows called Holsteins that are high milk producers that have been genetically bred, not genetically modified, but they've been bred to increase the, the milk production. And the side effects of that breeding has been to create milk that has a very inflammatory protein in it called A1 casein. All the old cows, the heirloom cows, sheep and goat, they have A2 casein, which is generally well tolerated, doesn't cause digestive problems for most people, is easy to digest. And then we homogenize it. So even taking milk, the same, the same milk you could get from like a Holstein cow, if you homogenize it, you have raw milk, it has profound different effects on your cholesterol, your metabolism, all sorts of stuff. And that's just kind of a minor point. But the, the major point is that when you, when you eat, for example, sheep or goat cheese or A2 casein cows, which they're about like Jersey and Guernsey and some other, and other heirloom cows, it doesn't create a lot of the same things because it has different information. And it goes even beyond that. So I was in Sardinia 
and uh, there they had they basically are sheep herders and goat herders and there's all these sheep and goats and they all kind of funny looking and uh they know they know that they need to take the sheep to to, to graze on different plants or the goats to graze on different plants at different times of year before they milk them to make the cheese because they know the flavor and the taste of the cheese will be better if they eat these certain plants now what's in those plants phytochemicals phytochemicals are the medicine in food and phytochemicals and this is like a massive aha i mean i've been studying nutrition for 40 years and this was a massive aha that taste and medicine and phytochemicals all go together. So the more the better something tastes, the more phytochemicals it is, the better it is for you. Now, these shepherds are not going, oh, I'm going to get my phytochemicals from the milk and I'm going to get the special cheese. No, they're like, this is, I know that. And then one guy said, you know, I flavor my meat before I kill the animal. I'm like, what do you mean? Wow. He says, we feed it carob and we feed it acorns and we feed it this and we feed it that and these plants and those things. And then we get the most amazing tasting meat. And, and it's like, and that's, that's something they've known for thousands of years. Now, now in America, there's a, a guy named Stephen Van Berlet and Fred Provenza who are studying the phytochemistry of meat. When you take a regenerally raised grass-fed meat and you analyze it, it's super high in these phytochemicals. Same thing with dairy if you're having you know, wild goats and, or goats and sheep are eating certain plants. And they can eat hundreds of different plants that have all these medicinal properties and the animals innately know what to eat in order to heal their bodies, in order to give them the nutrients they need. And we've lost our nutritional wisdom. And there's a book called Nourishment. You know, so basically re rediscovering our nutritional wisdom from animals. And they know exactly what to do. We've lost all that. And so how do we reclaim our wisdom so that we want to crave the things that are good for us and not bad for us? And we've had all of our brain chemistry and hormones dysregulated by the food industry in order to get us addicted to these processed foods that are full of sugar, salt, and fat in ways that are disrupting our normal ability to actually recognize what's good for us. And, and that can be corrected very quickly. It doesn't take a long time. Uh, so, so you're, you know, when you say was meat bad or good, that, I mean, I don't know how much time we have. We have a long, <laughs> long question, but the, 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 uh, the other study that really is profound was, and it, what was the only study that's sort of been done like this, if there's more money coming there's more of these studies being done, you know, uh, Utah State University, they're coming up. And, and what they did was they took kangaroo meat because it's pretty popular in Australia. It's wild kangaroo meat. And they, they gave it to people and they gave the, then they gave the same people on different weeks, like regular feedlot meat. And they measured their biomarkers and they gave them, it was like the exact amount of protein. So if you look at the nutrition facts, they both protein, protein, all that fat, everything the same, exactly, right? But the, there was a profound difference in their biology and the immune markers and inflammation. When you ate the kangaroo meat, the inflammation went down. When you eat the feedlot meat, the inflammation went up. Like, whoa, like that's breakthrough. And so really, the, that's why quality matters. It's not just I'm eating a piece of meat. What meat? And how was the animal raised? And what were the conditions? And what's the in, sort of environmental impact? And you know, there, there are really three issues when it comes to meat. The first is, um, basically like you hinted at spiritual you know is it ethical and humane to kill animals that's a debatable question right and i think depending on your beliefs and your religion and you know i mean i have many buddhist monks as patients i don't tell them to eat meat if they have a certain belief but the truth is you know um the entire world is one big you know restaurant consuming itself like look everything is everything everything we become food for the plants the plants become food for the animals the animals become food for us it's like the circle of life if anybody watched the lion king it's kind of like that you know like <laughs> i mean and and i mean if you watch some of those uh david attenborough movies like wow you know like it's kind of brutal out there but every everybody's trying to survive and i think you know we are we are all we're food you know for we're, we're going to be food for for fungi and for bacteria and for like we're just food and there yeah. it's all this big thing so and then if you think, oh, well, you know, but you're not really killing animals and, and you're, 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 if you're a vegan, well, okay, maybe, but, but not really. When you look at the data, 7 billion animals die every year because of growing vegetables. You destroy the actual a habitat, you kill the rabbits and the birds, 50% of bird species are gone. I mean, is a, is a rabbit that gets killed when the machine's going and harvesting the broccoli worth less than a chicken or a cow or a sheep? Yeah. Who's to say? 
right? I don't know, but the, you're not getting out of killing something, whatever you're eating, right? Yeah, yeah. And the plants, plants have 20 senses. They have more senses than we have. They communicate in ways that we don't even understand. They have levels of intelligence. So if one, if one, if one uh, plant is getting eaten by some caterpillar, it secretes chemicals through its roots that goes underneath the ground through this mycelium network and connects to other plants and says, hey guys, secrete this other chemical because the caterpillar doesn't like that. I'm trying to get rid of them, but you don't want to get eaten. So don't. like, it's unbelievable what's actually wow. going on. So where, who is to say about that? Anyway, yep. so that's the spiritual <laughs> thing. And I'm not... The say, and then and then there are humane ways to raise animals where they're out in their natural habitat where they're you know free i mean i was in maui and there was like this whole you know ancient cattle herd that was roaming around i'm like you do anything with them I'm like no we just let them roam around and do their thing and when it's time we kind of <laughs> call the herd and it was like they're just living their life doing their thing being cows and and i think you know uh so th there, there's a there's a lot of conversation there the second is environmental and that's something that people really log on to like, okay, well, yeah, okay, maybe, you know, whatever about the ethical thing, but, you know, it's definitely going to cause global warming and it's the biggest cause of climate change. And like, we've got to stop factory farming and cat and nobody should eat any meat. And there are, there are people out there saying we should eat no meat on the planet. Nobody should be eating meat because it's the worst thing for climate. Mm -hmm. And that's true if you're looking like this through the blinders of factory farming. And absolutely factory farming is unethical, inhumane, it's environmentally destructive. It's disastrous for climate. It's terrible for our health and humans as well. It just should be banned. Yeah. That doesn't mean that if you eat a wild kangaroo meat or some, you know, cheese from a goat that's been roaming around in the Sardinian mountains, or you eat a regenerative fed beef from many of the ranches in America that have been treated amazingly and, and are actually full of phytochemicals and have higher omega threes and and have more minerals and antioxidants and actually are quite different when you eat them and their effect on your biology, that that's you know, bad for you, but it also doesn't mean it's bad for the climate. In fact, this is something that people don't understand is that the agricultural and food system is the number one cause of climate change, but it's not methane from cows. It's not you know, the factory farming alone, which is a, percent, a, a significant percent, you could sort of debate it, but you know, just, just to put in perspective, the uh, the, 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 this, the fertilizer that we use, for example, on the plant foods we eat produces three times the amount of methane as cows in factory farms. How? Because in order to make the fertilizer, you use nitrogen. Nitrogen is an energy intensive process to extract nitrogen from the air and create fertilizer they get the the energy for the production of nitrogen comes from fracking and if you look at the industry of fracking the methane produced is three times that of cow farts and burps and whatever they're doing you know <laughs> so you just got to tell the whole truth the whole story and not kind of be in this confused conversation so yes we need to end factory farming and we need to upscale regenerative farming so oh i can't feed the world that's that's, that's naive it's not true. I mean, the UN estimates that we could, in, if we just took two of the 5 million hectares of degraded land around the world and we turned it to regenerative farming, it would cost $300 billion, which is less than we spent on diabetes. It's less than six months, three months, I think two months of the whole world global military budget. If we did that, um, I, mean, I mean, we're talking about like $3, billion, $3 trillion spending bills, right? On um, whatever, yeah. whatever. It would stop right. climate change for 20 years. 20 years. And, and, and Alan Williams has done the anal analysis. If we took the degraded land in America, if we took BLM land, you know, that's not being used, if we took uh, farmland that's being used for, you know, GMO corn and soy that's used to feed the animals. And if we did, if we, we just kind of rejiggered things based on our existing inventory of land and production. We could more than double the production of cows and meat in America using only regenerative methods. So, well, you kind of got, you got to get into the science and I know I'm getting a little nerdy on this, but it's just, it's, I, 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 when people are too simplistic about it, this good, that bad, that's the joke about the pegan. It's not this good, that bad. It's like, let's, let's figure out the truth here. Yeah. 
Totally. And, and if people just, I mean, when I found out again, I eat way less meat than I did before. I'm type O blood type. I've tried to be vegetarian. I've tried to be vegan for a moment. And I just find myself, I have way lower energy, but when I, but I've also lowered my meat content because my why is I want to save the earth. I want to heal the planet. I want to, I'm really, you know, in favor of regenerative farming and changing our food systems and ending factory farming. But when I found out how cows are raised and treated, but also what they eat, you are what you eat eats. And so yeah, just, right. I mean, if you knew what a, a prime steak is fed in these feedlots mm. and then how they're killed and they're, they're actually have open sores on their body. They're diabetic cows because they're fed an unnatural diet to get fat and sick. And then they're stuffed with antibiotics. Yeah. You're yeah. consuming that meat at this fancy yep. steak restaurant as a prime steak. It's like, you want to eat a grass-fed cow. You want to eat a, a cow that's healthy and, and is treated properly and doesn't have all that scared, toxic, sick energy in their system, sadly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So true. Oh my gosh. So let's then jump to the other crop that has changed with this whole European uh, you know, juxtaposition. I can go, I don't have a gluten sensitivity, but so many do. There's been a whole change to this dwarf wheat and GMO wheat. And why is it so important to, um, to understand why wheat has changed in America and what it's doing to our bodies and why everybody now has these gluten sensitivities? In yeah. Body? Well, I mean, it's a longer conversation, but I mean, there's the grain question and then there's the wheat question. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, you know, uh, grains can be great, but which grains? And again, it's like, feedlot cow, you know, wild kangaroo, you know, current grains we eat in America or heirloom corn from the Native Americans or Himalayan tartary buckwheat from the Himalayas, it, profoundly different compounds, right? So, so let's just sort of explain why we have this wheat problem. Um, it, it's a couple of things. One, during, during the Green Revolution, a guy named Norman Borlaug developed a strain of wheat called uh, dwarf wheat, which was able to be grown in difficult conditions with drought and didn't, you know, and just was more resilient and, and produced way better uh, amounts of starch. So it's, it created a lot of starch and a lot of grain. Uh, you know, those big amber tall fields of wheat, what is that American song we sing? <laughs> like, they're like, instead of those of the fields are like wheat like this, it was like wheat like this, right? But it's, it's, it's like basically full of, of amylopectin A, which is a super starch. And, and that is worse than your blood sugar for you than table sugar. It literally raises your blood sugar more than table sugar. Oh. Uh, second, uh, it, it contains, when you breed plants, they, you breed their genetics together. It's not like humans where you get, you know, 23 pairs of chromosomes, you get 46. It's like 46 plus 46, 92. And that means that when they, when they breed, it, inadvertently, they produce a lot more inflammatory gluten proteins. So it's way more gluten than a traditional heirloom wheat. Third, they often will spray glyphosate on it at harvest, even though it's not a GMO product, in order to desiccate it, to dry it out, and to kill, to kind of make it easy to, to actually harvest it. And then that destroys your microbiome because glyphosate destroys not only the microbiome in the soil, but your own microbiome. And we'll get to why that's important. Lastly, they preserve the wheat with calcium propionate, which is a, a compound that causes behavioral difficulties, ADD, cognitive changes, and in animals, models has literally causes autism when you put it in the brain. Oh, <laughs> so wow. when you see these kids eating wheat, they're like, oh, like this. So, um, and then those are enough reasons. But then yeah. we have a whole culture where we've destroyed our microbiome. How? Our processed diet, lack of fiber, too much sugar, starch, C-sections, early antibiotics, uh, lack of breastfeeding, and all the gut-busting drugs we take acid blockers, Advil, aspirin, all that. All that together has caused our guts to be damaged. So when you have a damaged gut with all these extra gluten proteins, you get gluten sensitivity and celiac. And when you look at the data, there's been an actual real increase in true celiac disease from 50 years ago to now of 400%. That's not trivial. That's literally 400% increased risk. And that's because of the changes in the wheat and our gut and all these other things. So we we are we should really never be eating that now unfortunately it is it is sort of 
the staple in our culture. It's in everything. Um, and we need to think about how do we start to cultivate different forms of agriculture. So a friend of mine, Jeffrey Bland, has created um, a company called Big Bold Health, where they produce Himalayan tartary buckwheat, which is an ancient strain of buckwheat from the Himalayas. It was grown in hard conditions. It was grown under a lot of stress, lack of water, you know, cold climate, crappy soil, who knows what else it had to deal with. And it made it resilient. So it's basically what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And wild plants have way more nutrients than organic, have way more nutrients than conventional, right? And the reason for that is because the stress makes them produce their own defense systems. The defense systems of the plants are the phytochemicals. There's 132 phytochemicals in Himalayan tarry buckwheat. And many of those do things that we've never seen before in terms of rejuvenating your immune system and killing zombie cells and like staving off aging and all kinds of stuff that, and then they may, they may, some of these chemicals don't exist anywhere else in the plant world. Yeah. So you can eat buckwheat flour and make buckwheat pancakes. And I have a vegan diet recipe in here for chai buckwheat pancakes that are really good. You can use the Himalayan tarry buckwheat flour, upgrade your pancakes. And <laughs> You know, and 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 end up getting all these benefits. It also has way more protein. It has way less starch. Has lower glycemic load. It has lots of more magnesium, more zinc. So you've got different information coming to your body from the different product. And so we can eat these other grains, and it depends on you. Some people, you know, have issues when they need to heal their gut and they need to reset their system. And but you know, the question is, what what are we sensitive to? Is why are we so sensitive? Mm -hmm. Right. And if we can yeah. fix that, then it's not, it's not, it's not to build, you know, a structure around your life that li makes you live in a bubble. It's to get you resilient. And that's the whole purpose of functional medicine. When I was really sick, I couldn't eat anything. I lived on turkey, broccoli, and brown rice for like a year because everything else just made me sick. And I, I can eat anything now. I mean, I can eat things like, like gluten doesn't bother me. Dairy doesn't bother me. I don't eat a lot of it. But, but it's because I've strengthened my whole system so I'm resilient and I'm healed. And, you know, I'm always healing. I'm always, it's a work in progress, but yeah. it, you know, it's, it's just fascinating to see how you can literally reset. And I've seen this, I've, I've done testing where you do, you know, you do like a panel of allergies and you'll see, oh, there's like 30 different foods people are reacting to. They're not true allergies. And then you heal their gut and then there's like four. I'm like, yeah. how does that happen? Well, it's because the body's not getting exposed and there's a proper balance in their gut and immune system tell me so, like type 2 diabetes i know that you know almost everybody i've talked to their functional medicine integrative you know holistic they, they can reverse type 2 diabetes within let's say 30 days what are some by just using food as medicine right and taking out the bad stuff and adding in the good stuff what like rheumatoid arthritis some other common chronic illnesses that people are coming down with younger and younger in today's society. And there's so many factors, but what in your practice or in your world have you seen that like two people my age or slightly younger have been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and both under a tremendous amount of stress and lots of other factors going on. But I'm like, you don't need to be on a pill the rest of your life. Like go get the blood test, like change your diet first. Like Talk to me about some of the things you've seen turned around that a lot of people don't have the awareness that they can. Look, I mean, yeah, everybody knows, you know, you're overweight and you eat better, you're going to lose weight. Or even in diabetes, you know, even though in medicine, still today, there isn't the approach of, in, in medical uh, practice is not reverse diabetes, it's Medicaid diabetes, it's manage diabetes. Right. It, it, even within healthcare today, there's not an understanding that you can use food to reverse diabetes. Even though it's been proven, it's been shown over and over. I can send you 70 studies, you know, <laughs> to show this. Right. So that's that's a big problem. Other stuff that's not so obvious is is even worse. Right. Autoimmune diseases, uh, Alzheimer's, autism, Parkinson's, migraines, stuff that you just you know chronic people, chronic digestive problems that people have, that they just are managed with medications. So it's really, it's really important people understand that there is a way through to get better if you understand how the body truly works, not the way we were taught in medical school, not based on all these diseases and symptoms, but the actual design of the body. What is the human design? We have very, very, until recently not had a clue. Functional medicine is essentially a map of how the body is truly organized. 
Amazing. Yeah. And can, so, so if someone has an autoimmune disorder, uh, cause I get messages all the time, what do I do? How do I heal? Do I go to a functional medicine doctor to get the feedback from the blood and the guidance to start to do an elimination yeah. diet and I mean, find I, the things that are triggering. Yeah. I mean, I wrote a book, I read a lot of books. So like one of the book I wrote was called the, the 10 day detox diet and that book and the 10 day reset it's in here too. Uh, that if people try it, it, it fixes all kinds of things. Like that's what we did, for example, for that retreat. And it's a fairly extreme diet, but essentially it's basically lots of veggies, nuts and seeds, lots of good fats, berries, and eating good quality protein, but it cuts out sugar, processed food, gluten, dairy, grains, beans, and just does it for a short period of time to see what happens. And when you pull everything out, it could be a problem. The body has a moment to go, oh, I'm good. And so I've had people say, God, Dr. Hyman, I did your 10-day detox. My rheumatoid arthritis went away in 10 days. Is that possible? I'm like, well, if it was caused by what you're eating, yes. If it was caused by mercury or Lyme disease or 10, one of the other 10 other causes that we can find, no, it might not get better. But it's, it's really personalized. And, that, and that's important for people to realize. Just because you have rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't mean you know what's wrong with you, right? Just because you know the name of the disease, it doesn't mean you know what's wrong with you because the causes for each person with the same name disease can be profoundly different. And that's what functional medicine is. Awesome. Okay. So uh, last question for people listening that says, yeah, you know, it's organic and eat the rainbow and eat, it's so much, it's too expensive to eat, you know, organic produce and, and, and all of the healthy foods. So I, ha I have to feed my kids <laughs> McDonald's or whatever. How, how can you, you talk a little bit in the book about how to eat affordably. Can you give people some tips yeah. or some perspective? Well, listen. Listen, I think, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of different um, mantras of the food industry that have uh, permeated our culture that are false. One is that all calories are the same, it's all about moderation. So you can have soda as long as it's within your calorie count. Nonsense. The other is, you know, exercise more and eat less. Nonsense. But there's certain ideas that, that serve the food industry. Another one is it's expensive and elitist to eat healthy. You know, people are poor and they can't afford it. Don't make them feel guilty and bad. The truth is so far from that. We know, and, and this is not just my opinion, we know from well done research trials that you can actually educate people on what to eat and what to buy and how to cook and, and feed themselves for less than they can eat at McDonald's. You know, Mark Bittman wrote an article, for example, in the New York Times about how you can make, make your family of four a dinner of chicken, a salad, a baked potato, and whatever else for less than you can go to McDonald's. And it probably is about the same time. So we know that you can you can eat well for less. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And there's a lot of tips in the book of how to eat well for less. And you, there's ways, there's places to shop at wholesale. There's ways to get stuff direct from farmers or stuff. There's all sorts of opportunities for for, for eating well for less. And, and, and you know, there's a, there's a story that I tell around this, which is uh, based on the movie Fed Up that I was in years ago, where they... They had his family in South Carolina that was severely overweight and sick. And the father was 42, had diabetes, already on dialysis at 42. Disability, food stamps, family of five. Mother like the huge, the son was huge, 16 years old, almost diabetic. Mm. And, you know, I didn't know if I could help them. And, and they, they lived in, in one of the worst food deserts in America. And it's registered by... The, the, they call the Retail Food Environment Index, which is how many fast food and you know, convenience stores are there compared to healthy grocery stores. And it was just, it was one of the worst in the country. So disability, food stamps, worst food desert in America. Okay, I'm thinking, this is gonna be rough. But I, go, I go in there, I said, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. Let's go shopping and let's get some food and let's make dinner. <laughs> and I, so we, we got some groceries and I use this guide called Good Food on a Tight Budget from the Environmental Working Group where I'm on the board. And I made turkey chili, some roasted sweet potatoes, salad from real ingredients, not like iceberg lettuce, <laughs> actual olive oil and vinegar instead of, I said, look, look at, look what was in your, look at the vinegar, look at their salad dressing, full of, full of, 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 of high fructose corn syrup and refined oils and all these emulsifiers and really horrible shit for you. <laughs> and we made dinner and they ate it and they were like, wow, this is really good. 
and the, the kid never ate vegetables. They'd never eat. They never. They never. They didn't know how to stir fry. They didn't know how to cut an onion. They didn't have a cutting board. They didn't have a knife. They had like a you know a table knife, but they didn't have an actual knife to cut food. It was unbelievable. So I sent. I, I said, okay, well here's this guide. Here's 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 my cookbook. Uh, here's and and I, I said you guys can do this. And I'm like I didn't know they could do it. But I just, you know, <laughs> I, I went home, I, on the plane home, I ordered from Amazon, I ordered knives, and I ordered a cutting board, cutting boards, <laughs> and I sent it there. <laughs> and I'm like, what happened? So a week later, she texts me, we lost 18 pounds this week. I'm like, wow. Fast forward, the father lost 45 pounds, got a new kidney, the mother lost 100 pounds, the son lost 50, but then went to work at Bojangles, which is like a fast food place down there, and that's the only place they can, these oh. kids can get jobs gain 50 he says like put an alcoholic to work in a bar Ugh. and then eventually you know he stayed in touch with me and i helped him and he lost 138 pounds wow and his family had never gone to college i don't know they had finished high school and and he he one day wrote me he said would you please write me a letter of recommendation for medical school oh my God. and i'm like sure and so i wrote him this beautiful letter and he got into medical school and he's a doctor I'm like, oh my gosh. so, I mean, you know, the, the answer to the question is, can it be done is yes. Does it take a little work? Yes. But don't buy the myth that it's elitist. Yeah. If you want to buy a $70 grass fed ribeye steak. Okay. And, and it's just upgrading the quality. Even if just a little bit, doesn't mean you can everything organic, doesn't mean grass fed, you do the best you can. But even if you switch from all the processed food to just real food, even if it's conventional real food, way better for you. Yes. Uh, you, you say know your why that helps you. I mean, this guy, if you want to, I didn't, I, I full confessions as we wrap up. I, I literally was a pickets eater growing up. I was raised on Kraft macaroni and cheese, Domino's pizza, McDonald's. My favorite. And, yeah. Kraft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> it was, I think I'm probably part, I'm like probably 10% macaroni and cheese in my body. <laughs> I think so. That powder and cheese, that orange. Oh. Yeah. Anyways. I, you know, in t and, but I played three sports. I was very active and it didn't affect me. Thank God. I, I don't know how I didn't do irreparable damage on my innards, but, um, you know, I, I went to college, drank a lot, looked in the mirror and I was like, oh shit. So I started eating vegetables and changed my diet because that was my why I wanted to, but like you said, you can, there, our bodies are so intelligent and resilient and mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's never too late to start. So I, no. I really appreciate, uh, this book. I really appreciate, you know, your continued work. You're um, thousands of books that you've written uh, I'm but I, <laughs> maybe, maybe just one time get in there <laughs> um, yeah so uh I, I encourage anybody to pick up the pegan diet because it's chock full of information um that's that's easy to adjust and get you on the right track and and seek out a functional medicine doctor like like dr hyman here and, and thank you so much where where's the best place for people to find all of your books oh gosh well go to drhyman.com that's kind of ground zero no, I'm on Instagram and all it's Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Mark Hyman, or Instagram, Facebook, and I have a podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy, which is on all podcast outlets. So it's plenty, plenty of places to find me. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. You take care. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.